we're, we're starting. We're going to start the Arlington Finance Committee meeting of March 1st. I am Chair Christine Deschler. We have with us um, Dr. Dawson and uh, people representing the Minuteman uh, Technical High School for this presentation. But before we get to that, let's do the minutes real quick. Um, I'm going to log out. I think um, you just need to turn the volume up on your computer. And then when I present, I'll be able to show you the Yes. Sorry, Alice checking it. Does anyone have any other corrections to the minutes of February 25th? Could you go to the top? Does everyone else have nine eight nine eight three three nine six for the salary for the town manager department? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So any any other corrections, revisions? Is there a moat? Charlie. I haven't checked with the number that I sent you for the In other words, the number that we reported at the meeting was correct. It doesn't have to be changed. We right. direct the letter directing fund or the number directing funding the fifteen million dollar number. No, the bottom line number, taxation number. That that I right. gave in the report was correct. There was some question about that at the end of the meeting. Right. I actually don't. Fourteen one thirty three seven three five. It's the one that has the extra hundred forty dollars in it. Whatever that was. What was the number you had? L one four one three three seven three five. Yep. Okay, that's what we got. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So, so moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the minutes have been approved. Yeah, that's a lot faster. Yeah, it is. All right. Um, since you are here, yes. why don't we turn it over to you? Great. Dr. Dawson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathleen Dawson, and I'm the proud new superintendent of Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School District. And your uh, school committee representative will be with us shortly. He's on his way and, um, you know, work. So, um, but he'll be joining us shortly. And uh, with me today is our business manager, Ms. Nikki Andrade. And we are here. Uh, we do have a presentation. I'm going to try to share that. And 
Horse disabled, if you could. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. This happens all the time. It's only been three years, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But um, while we're waiting to do that, I just want to say and just share how excited I am to be able to actually be here in person and to meet all of you and um, to share this information and to be able to have dialogue about our budget request. And um, we'll get, once we get started, I don't know if you want to ask questions along the way. You can do that if you'd like. Uh, what we've been doing is presenting the whole thing and then questions at the end so that if, there, if we covered we might cover something to answer your question in advance um and so that's uh we've been able to do that and okay so what, what why don't you go ahead and give your presentation yep then we'll have questions at the end i i think everyone has seen the materials too so um, so i'll go quickly so that we can have more time for um that sounds good yeah focus on my notes so we can be quick and um, so, yeah, so please know that I'm we'll be going quickly because I know you've already read the material, okay? Um, but you know, we spent a lot of time. So thank you for listening to the presentation. All right, so again, greetings. My name is Kathleen Dawson. And tonight we are here to present our fiscal year 2024 budget recommendation for Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School District. And we hope to be able to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. So tonight we present to you a budget that's focused on supporting our students and our staff. The budget supports our purpose of ensuring our students have highly qualified professionals and that our staff are equipped to provide relevant and rigorous learning opportunities with the most up-to-date technologies and curricula. This budget supports the academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students so they can develop into their best selves. And what we've really seen, especially after the pandemic, is that the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students have uh, grown even more so than before. Um, so, you know, we just wanted to start with our why, right? That our budget does reflect our values and our priorities, and those are our students and our staff. So just a quick reminder, you know, our school-wide goals for this year, and our budget is grounded in improving teaching and learning for all of our students. And these are our school-wide goals, and to support us in accomplishing these goals, Minuteman's FY24 operating and capital budget request overall is up, but only 4.5% compared to our FY23 budget. Our district budget objectives follow along with our school priorities and goals. The top three objectives are the safety of our students and staff, the quality of our education, and the professional development of our staff. Some additional objectives include increasing access to what Minuteman has to offer by expanding the enrollment capacity of the facility, making sure that we're maximizing um, that with the facilities that we currently have. Capitalizing on the potential use and expansion of the athletic fields for the benefit of our students and communities, thus also increasing potential revenue. So lastly, uh, successfully closing out our current MSDA school building project. So some of the major drivers in our budget for FY24 include the, the teacher contract negotiations that we're currently undertaking um, right now. And with the increase in enrollment, we are, are in need of three new full-time teachers and Minuteman's participation in a health trust with four other regional vocational schools. They have not set their final rates yet for FY24, but they are recommending that we carry a 10% increase at this point in our budgeting. And the impact of inflation on the prices of supplies and materials needed mainly for our CTE instruction required to meet industry standards. So some of our additional drivers, we have an increase in costs for transportation and the building utilities and heating, et cetera. Some of that due to inflation. The increase of the OPEP contribution based on the recommendation of our OPEP study committee, the continued funding of our capital stabilization fund, which will support some of the strategies for supporting our um, capital needs. Just to break out the FY24 a little bit more, our operating expenses are up about 6.18%, and our operating capital, which includes our ESCO lease payment, our athletic field lighting debt, and the capital stabilization funding is fairly consistent at 0.21%. And the ESCO lease payment the last year will be FY25. 
Minuteman's capital building project set is slightly lower in FY24 than 23. And this is an important breakout as seven of our nine member towns voted a debt exclusion on the school building project. So the total preliminary assessment for Arlington, including the building project debt service that is excluded from Prop 2 and a half is approximately $8.9 million. And the preliminary assessment for Arlington without the building project debt is approximately $7 million. Now, a major factor impacting the operating budget is our enrollment. With the plans for the new school building came the plan for increasing in-district student enrollment. That was a major driver for the new building. And as noted here, we are successfully meeting that objective. Enrollment from our member towns are increasing as the enrollment from the non-member towns, they are matriculating out with each graduating class. And we're very proud to say that this year was our first freshman class that came all from our member towns. As enrollment um, shifts, Minuteman's out of district revenue is decreasing, both from tuition and capital fee, which is set by the state. And as a result, our member towns are having to pick up that responsibility for the cost. And soon it will be all of the cost with operating capital budget through their assessment. In the next few slides here, we'd like to show you the comparison of changes in enrollment to the changes in revenue. This first purple line across the top is our school designed enrollment of 628 at 85% capacity. And when we add the tricolored bar graph, which includes the total, the member and non-member enrollment compared to the 85% school capacity indicated by the purple line, you'll see as the graph shows, we are over our 85% capacity. And here we're showing with the yellow line, which represents the non-member tuition and the light blue line, which represents the capital fee revenue available to reduce member assessment. As you can see, these are trending in the opposite direction of our increasing enrollment. Here we show the percent change in our four-year rolling average of enrollment, which is the blue column, with the percent change in assessment, which is red for all of our member towns. For most of our member towns, these correspond and track together closely as spelled out in our regional agreement. It is important to note that the four-year rolling average will eventually even out for the next few years as enrollment becomes over the next few years, sorry, um, as enrollment becomes more typical of full freshman classes of member town students. And for Arlington, uh, you will see that there was a 16% increase in four year rolling average, but a 12% increase in total assessment. You can see year over year here, the comparison of our assessments. And as seen in the graph on the prior slide, Arlington's four-year rolling average has increased by 15.7% compared to the total assessment increasing by 12.4%. And despite the increase in operating assessment, the per pupil assessment remains relatively consistent over the past five years. And just a um, little more information of our current Arlington student breakdown. In grade nine, we have 66 students. In grade 10, 60 students grade 11, 55, and grade 12, 34 students. So as you see over the years, that has increased. And then when you have that outlier of 34, that's kind of skewing your um, four-year rolling average. So once we get a little bit typical um, of more closer numbers, that average will even out. So as presented, it is the shift in enrollment that are increasing the assessments for each member town. And the increase is paying for more of Arlington students to have access to a choice in the type of uh, type and quality of career technical education. And as I attended um, parent town hall meetings in each town, I had a great showing in Arlington and thank you to all the parents who did show up. Um, you know, one of the common themes that came across all of the towns, how appreciative your families are, our families are, that you are supporting them having this choice. They're seeing that, you know what, had they gone to a different type of school, they would not be thriving as they are at Minuteman, and they are really appreciating that choice. So on behalf of them and for Minuteman, we thank you for that support. This uh, next slide here, just uh, giving you the assessments, the FY24 assessments, of all of our member towns, so you can kind of see how that compares. And then 
where are we now for next year? This is really exciting. Our enrollment trends are continuing and going strong. Our eighth graders have completed their applications for next fall. And as of February 15th, we had 329 applications from our member towns for only 180 seats. And 83 of um, applications actually from non-member towns because there are non-member towns um, and the towns, the families and students who are still interested in trying to get into Minuteman. The only way that we would even consider a non-member town student is if they're um, all of our member town students, there's no wait list. And if we have a program with an opening, only then will we consider taking it out of town, um, non-member town students. Uh, so as of February, let's kind of look where we are we with Arlington students. February 15th, we closed the application window. Your families did receive offer letters. Um, and Arlington is slotted for, well, you had 82, we had 82 qualified applicants from Arlington. The slot allocation for Arlington is 42 students and 66 were offered admission, which as of right now leaves 16 on the waiting list and families have till March 8th to either accept or decline the offer. And um, so even though we have 16 on the wait list, that's not the final wait list. Um, and historically, you know, we, we've been able to try to get more and more students off the wait list before the start of the school year. But as um, interest has grown and we're getting higher numbers also from our other towns who would normally have lower numbers, now they're, we're getting some higher numbers. So um, we'll have to see how many students will be able to take off the wait list. So the increase in enrollment is requiring three additional full-time teachers. And being cautious of our budget and assessments impact on our member towns, Minuteman is not requesting funding for all of the positions and the needs that we have in order to you know, provide the level of service of excellence to our students. This, uh, there's still quite a bit of need for Minuteman. And as you can see, there are a number of positions and um, other roles. But however, we will do what we've been doing Everyone picks up a little more and we all, you know, do go above and beyond to try to make sure that all these other needs are covered. Some of it, um, and it, it is hard, right? Especially after coming out of a pandemic, people are, you see it nationally, like teachers are burned out, they're tired, our staff are tired, um, but they also know that, you know, there, this is, there's a level of burden on everyone in all of our towns. And this is why we're only coming to you asking for the bare minimum that we need. And we, that's the three teaching positions with, to support the increase in enrollment. And just so you know, we don't solely rely on our member towns to fund all of the district's needs. We're always working diligently to apply for grants and we've been very fortunate to receive a number of them recently. And as you can see here, uh, without these grants, it would have required an additional $3 million for the FY23 budget. And in essence, that saved us 10% um, for this current year. The district uses these grants um, to fund positions. We're careful to do that because as we know, when grants end, those positions end. So we are very careful how we do that. To support new curricula, CTE programming, uh, student programming, it's really helped out our major um, purchases for CTE programs because these equipment are not cheap. Grant funding is starting to support our Minuteman Technical Institute, which is our post-secondary program, almost in its entirety now, and it will not rely on our member town funding to operate next year. One of the uh, reasons why we were able to actually lower our request for FY24 to 4.5% was the last minute, like $500,000 grant we did get right towards the end, so we were able to modify our request um, it was the capital skills grant, and that $500,000 is helping to grow our animal science program, which we're going into its third year next year. So we're really excited about that. Um, this doesn't include all of the grants. You know, we, we know that there's some ESSER dollars that we have received, but that we're continuing to support some of the other needs that we have. Some of them are positions, but again, being careful with that. The um, 
right now we're you know using some extra dollars to also support our after school extra support for our students needing that academic support especially as MCAS um, testing <coughs> engineering so we're, you know that's an example of how we're using extra dollars at the beginning we did use extra dollars uh, to ensure you know just that continued support of the devices that our students needed being all remote and because we are a one-to-one -one district each year, you know, we've had to make sure that all of our incoming freshmen have their devices. So that was a huge support um, and a large um, amount of the ESSER went towards supporting that. Um, so the next slide here, building enrollment beyond the design capacity of 628. We will do so with no request to our towns for additional funding, no new debt. Um, and as previously shared, our enrollment has exceeded the capacity and the plan is to meet this growth and look to expand and um, as much as our facilities will allow without any additional debt. And some of our strategies, strategy uh, number one is to continue contributing a portion of the budget to the capital stabilization account now, I do want to be clear that we are not, the plan is not to use the capital stabilization um, fund for any like new building, but we may need that to make renovations in our existing or, um, you know, like right now we're having to find additional space for our animal science program as it continues to grow. So if there are walls that we have to put up or, you know, those types of renovations, we would be using the capital um, stabilization fund. And of course, for emergencies that come up, right, with the needs. Um, this will allow us to support the current new project. We do have a current project in progress right now, and that's our North Meadow Fab shop. And that was, not, it's not a part of the new building, but it started uh, towards the end of, so it's in progress right now. Um, that will allow us to move some of the heavier equipment from our welding and manufacturing area, move that out to create a little bit more space for them. That will allow a few more students to be able to join that program. Our second strategy is to continue to leverage our strategic partnerships and grants to put buildings that we're not currently using to use. For example, in our East Campus building. So when you're driving um, up the main gate right before the athletic field, there's a road and there's a building there that has been used for various different types of programs in the past, but currently it's um, not being used. So we're taking a look at what can we do to um, with that building so that we can create more classroom space because we are full at our main building, but it may also allow us to create a few more classrooms that if it is possible for us to um, increase our enrollment to try, try to provide more students access, that is an option we are looking at. Um, the capital stabilization account, just to provide a little more context, back in 2016, the school committee did establish this um, account to be prepared for any capital needs that may come up. And the balance is under $2.5 million. And this that is basically through the strategic plan of setting aside that 500,000 each year. How we spend that money, the school committee will always um, review and either approve or not. Um, so it's not like I go and with our team and say, hey, we have all this money, let's see what we can do with it. We will do that, but then we'll say, hey, school committee, do we have your permission and do you support this? Um, and then, so you'll see in our budget that we're requesting the 500,000 to continue toward that fund. And the, um, as the capital stabilization account is one of the major drivers, so is our school committee's responsibility for maintaining the funding for OPEB. And this does require a long-term strategy recommended by the OPEB advisory subcommittee. Currently, we're slightly over 500,000, but as you can see, we need to drastically increase that contribution if we are to meet the liability amount of over $20 million. So how will we do that? Um, the increase in future years is reasonable, and we feel that we can accomplish that due to our ESCO lease ending in FY25. So once that um, payment stops, we will then allocate that to the OPEG um, fund. And this total is broken out between the active retiree health insurance and the OPEG contribution. 
Also, it's recommended that as we bring on any new FTE positions, that we set aside ten thousand dollars to go towards this fund, so that we make um, making sure that we keep that up per new employee. So as we start to bring this budget presentation to a close, this is a summary of our operating and capital budget and the breakouts with the total operating and capital budget request increase of only 4.5%. There, these are the components of the assessments that will be included in our budget book. And lastly, our overall budget request in comparison to FY23 is less than the prior year's uh, requests in all categories. So as in closing, we return to our values. Those are our students and their learning. And we recommend the FY24 budget that will support the needs of our students and their teachers. And thank you. Thank you very much for all of your support on behalf of our students, our staff, and our families. Um, it does make a world of difference. So with that, if there are any questions, I open. Awesome. I just want to make sure that you're, the, the amount you're looking for is 8 million nine. 32916. That's that. Okay. All right. Questions? Starting with Annie, who is our student. So, my first question is We talked about having 82 qualified applicants from Arlington, but is that 82 total applicants, or were there some applicants who considered non qualified, and if so, why? I want to say. I know that we have the. I'm going to. Um, Perry, is okay if I read them? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. So, there were 98 student applications and 82 qualified applications. Thank you for that. Being that we're not considered qualified, we're not qualified because. That's a good question. Um, I think why, why would they not be qualified? Yeah. I'm trying to, because they're not, I'm wondering if they're usually, most often, if they're not qualified, it's because they missed the deadline. Uh, so they're not considered right now. Um, missed, the application missed, right? missed the application. Usually that's about the only, you know, um, reason why they're not. And that's what I recall, like having conversation. Um, part of our application process, another like reason for um, disqualification because of the nature of our program and our kids having to go out in public, you know, with co-ops and, and working with companies, there are certain types of like suspensions and expulsions that would disqualify for them, qualify them. But these are like major, um, major ones, you know, not if they were just suspended for it. The major ones would be like the um, 37H, 37, like, Weapons, you know, like things that weapons violation or violent crime. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that extreme. But outside of that, having discipline history of outside of that does not disqualify. Okay. So, um, yeah. The only other thing I'll I'll chime in on is yeah. if someone started an application but didn't finish it, they wouldn't right. be a qualified sure. applicant. Yeah. Um, that's a, a very basic example of someone that. Um, so I was channeling Al when I asked that question. Chris, and I think he has a follow-up. Yeah. yeah, just on the whole issue of qualified versus non-qualified. There's a debate going on at the state level now about vocational education and how students are accepted. Uh, the traditional one is, you know, grades, attendance, yada, yada. Uh, the new one says, though, that that excludes students who might, be the, might find that vocational education is the most valuable for, uh, and they suggest using a lottery. Your thoughts? So our team actually was, I believe, proactive and had reviewed our admissions policy um, 
last year or two, like just recently. And in that assessment, we actually did make some changes to ensure that more students had access. So when we think about like grades, we changed it so because it's on a point system. So any student that gets anywhere between an A to a C, they get the full five points. So those kind of criteria we expanded to include more students. Um, the only time, you know, like uh, D would get two points and F would get zero points. Attendance, and so the grades are overall 20, 20%. Um, attendance is another 20%, but only unexcused absences are counted. And again, if they have zero to five absences, they get the 20 points. If they have six to 10 absences, they still get 15 points. If it's 11 to five, so we really try to expand the criteria to really be able to be more inclusive. Conduct, again, 20%, but again, it's that higher level of um, violations. And um, yeah, so again, it was either you get the full 20 points or you get zero points. And if you're getting zero points, it's because you have the 37th extreme, right? Otherwise, you're getting, so in essence, we're not really using discipline against you, right? Um, there is a recommendation form it's completed by a non-related adult. And then there's an interview and scores are from 15 to 20. You can't score lower than 15 points, right? And especially the interview, it's not to weed out. It's just to make sure that they know what it is and that this is really what they want. And if they have any questions, you know. Um, and it's pretty much a blind process in the sense that we don't know if they're, if they're a student on an IEP. Like we don't know anything more than, than this. And that is what also happened because of that blind process. We have a much higher percentage of students on IEPs than most other, um, well, most schools. We have, I know the last I had checked, we had 44%, um, it had gone down to 37%. Um, the, and, and if you see our per pupil expenditure, it is a bit higher than some of our other regional vocational school districts because of our higher number of students on IEPs because that requires more services. They, and especially now, what we're seeing is that the types of needs that our students have, we need more social workers, counselors. Um, so the last um, set of data that I looked at, we had about 22% that were in the lower socioeconomic status. We had about 37, there's actually 37% students on IEPs. And overall, when adding up all of the different criteria that the state uses to determine high needs, where over 52% of our students are on high needs. So when we think about, you know, are we providing access? We do feel that at this point, um, our students are having access. The one thing that I did look at was our racial um, breakdown. And um, when I took a look at that, um, it is fairly proportional to our racial demographic of our sending towns. It's hard to have, you know, more, um, a larger number of students from underrepresented groups racially when the towns don't have higher, you know, but when you take a look at if Arlington has, you know, 5%, 5% of our students, you know, so it's proportional. Um, so I think, in, I think we're one of those districts that can say, you know, a lottery may be more damaging than not because a lottery could actually prevent, you know, because it's all lottery. So we could do a lottery and we could have 15% of our students that are on IEPs actually get in, you know? So, but it is it is a blind process that we use. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Well, to Chris, actually, for other. Other questions? Rebecca. Um, I had two questions that, Oh, no, Annie already asked my question. Sorry. Um, I had a question about enrollment, and hopefully Annie said this to you ahead of time, but I was curious about transfers um, because I know that we base our enrollment number based on October 1st. So if the kids there are October 1st, they count. Um, so I had a question about um, how many kids transfer specifically from Minuteman back to Arlington High School mm -hmm. after October 1st, and whether you accept transfers the other way to compensate. Like if we take for the slot, 
but you lose a kid, can we send another kid in their spot? And I didn't have that one. Um, okay. <laughs> but I will get you that number. Okay. It's, uh, we actually, our attrition rate is about 5%. So that's why when we end up with our final number of um, accepted students, it's around 189 because 5%, you know, we have about nine students that will um, uh, transfer out over, you know, the four years for that uh, cohort of students. Um, when we take a look at it's grade nine or 10 that we will accept students if there's an opening either from our wait list, right? And if there's no one on our wait list, then from non-member towns who are on, because it's almost like we have two wait lists, right? We have those that are our member towns and then our non-member towns. But um, I shouldn't say that, like, it's not like we have two separate, but we, you know, we get that. Um, but after that, because of our scope and sequence of our career tech ed pathway, the only time that we would consider grade 11 or 12 is if they're looking to transfer from another career tech program. We don't necessarily say, okay, a student left from Arlington, so we let a student in from Arlington. We do who's next on the line, you know, on the wait list, and is it the program that they want? And if that's, and, and then if, you know, we'll say, okay, look, we, you may want this program, there's no openings, but we do have an opening here. You're the next on our wait list. Are you interested? Some, and oftentimes they say yes, because they just want to be at minute. Um, but the, you know, if they don't want that program, then we go to the next on the list. But I will get you the actual, you know, do we, we should have that count. So I, think, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, to me, philosophically, if we're we paying for the slot, I feel like we should, Arlington should get that slot. And mm -hmm. it, it depends whether we're talking about a couple kids or, you know, yeah. how many it is, sort of determine how big a deal it is. So, thank you. Do you have another question? Uh, no, no. Okay. Other questions? Jordan. Uh, my question was just regarding staffing additions. Um, you said that I believe that this budget reflects the addition of three uh, full-time uh, equivalent employees. Um, and then you mentioned that there were going to be, um, uh, there were eight additional FTE positions that were needed. Um, so this budget only reflects the three additional, correct? correct. Um, so for the eight additional positions that you, uh, it seems like you really do need, is there a plan for um, integrating those into a budget at a future time? Or I just wanted to know what your, what your plan was for those positions that it seems like you need. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you, especially the teaching position, um, We'll continue to review, right? Like what exactly, because why we really need those, our students, because so many of them are on IEPs, they get the accommodations met during their core content. But when they go to their CTE programs, they, that support doesn't always um, get there. And so we are going to have to take a look at how can we provide that support and in long-term budgets, is that something we're going to have to request funding for? Um, right now, again, is there other ways, like if there are grant funding, could we take on student teachers? What are different ways that we could cover those needs without having to add those positions to the budget? Um, but in all reality, you know, based on, again, how many students are coming in we may have an influx of students on IEPs that are going to be in our freshman class. And if we need additional, we may have to come and incorporate those in, into our budget request for the next fiscal year, right? That's just, it's just hard to say yes or no, because we do try to be very creative in finding ways to cover as much as we can. Um, yeah, so the reality is that we, we may, we may. Great, and thank you for your explanation. I just wanted to know what your thought process was and um, what the reasoning was behind, um, you know, letting us know what positions may be coming in the future. So thank you for the explanation. More questions? 
Yeah, so I have a couple. Um, so you mentioned that you had 42 slots for Arlington in the Harlan County class, and that you made 66 offers. So obviously that's more than 42. So how did you arrive at 66? Yeah, so we take a look at our historical trend of, you know, what percentage of our students that are offered actually end up accepting. And based on that data over time, we felt safe in um, offering that number over, knowing that, you know, there will be a number of students who will decline. But they'll be the, the yield is about yeah. 60%. Okay. Um, you mentioned capacity of the school expanding it, you know, the, I guess design capacity, which is 85% of 628, which would make around 740 now and you wanted to add I think 32 uh, and then maybe more like, yeah so um how big are how big do you think you can get the school I guess in terms yeah. of capacity without getting more more capital money from yeah. the so if you extrapolate out that 628 is at 85 percent 100 percent would be 720 but as you can see next year we're already at 734 Four. right um what we're thinking, and this is just me being very transparent, that with the East Campus building, if we get that either renovated or a new building there, that we could probably at best add four additional classrooms. And if we were to say on average 20 students per class, that we could potentially increase our enrollment to 800. Um, but first and foremost, we took a look at if we did that, what would that do to the integrity of what we offer? And so I, I do want to let you know, and I'll be sending out invitations very soon. Um, the school committee, knowing where we're at, foreseeing some things in the future, like there are other towns like Arlington building the schools that may detract our, the shiny new minute man, you know, and they might go to the next shiny new. Um, and just planning ahead, we are taking a look at what would it entail to add a new member town or two. And so the team has been working diligently to do some financial modeling to see the ramifications of that. And so we will be coming to you to say, okay, here's what we've been looking at. Here's some possibilities. This is something that the towns would be interested in considering. So. With that, um, we're looking at around 800 probably that we could as far as um, building out not, again, I'd have to go and work to find strategic partners, find other types of funding um, sources to see what's best. Is it better to just knock that building down and build a brand new one, which is I think what we're thinking would be the most cost effective in the long run. Um, and then if that's, if that is the way that we need to go, how much, and then what is it that we will have to do to raise those funds, but we will not be coming to towns to ask you for those funds. Okay. And I guess part of why I'm asking that is getting to what would Arlington's, you know, high water enrollment be potentially. Mm -hmm. I know you just, I wasn't thinking more member towns, but even right now we're at 215, you that you know you have a 34 I think senior class you're offering we have 42 slots so it's like 222 223 rather so just getting a sense of where our student you know at some point right if everybody comes even if everyone comes the building's full and you have to allocate slots per five member town in some fair way what do you see as Arlington's sort of peak enrollment capacity being yeah um I'm looking, playing the PowerPoint that we shared earlier. Um, I, we didn't calculate like what, because I think as things shift, we have to take a look at how are we doing seat allocations? And will that uh, percentage breakdown stay the same? Or will that shift, you know, with increase in numbers? If, and it'll be, it'll be different if there was a, a member town added. Maybe it's, maybe it's two towns that gets added, you know, and 
um, what we are going to be bringing to our town, like here are the different scenarios and um, the impact of that on assessments, if we did at right. towns, yeah. impact on that, and all, like all of those types of things is what we're looking to bring and to share to, with the towns um, towards the end of the month. Okay. Yeah, it would be interesting to see those projections. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll add to that, the, um, the director of teaching, learning and admissions, um, the annual minimum slot allocation is based on the weighted voting formula. So there's a portion that's 50% equal share, and then there's a 50% portion that's the average four year rolling enrollment. So um, it will somewhat vary, but if you have, if you, if your four year rolling average ends up being more consistent, you could get a good baseline of where all yeah, it could end up. And then one other question uh, on grants. Um, is any of that ARPA money? And sort of as a corollary, are they renewable grants? Yeah. I mean, you have 10% of your budget coming from grants. They could pay for those year over year. Yeah. So we there are, I don't think we've listed the ARPA. Money. Yeah, so we just listed the FY23 grants. Most of the ESSER and COVID funding was FY22 or FY21. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that there is a lot of um, competitive grants that we've applied for this year in particular. Um, as Dr. Dawson mentioned, the capital skills grants, um, a lot of grant money surrounding post-secondary in our MTI program. I'd say prior to COVID, we had about six, $700,000. We got almost annually between our title grants, our Perkins funding, our 240 grants. Um, but as you can see, the team has been working very hard um, on the competitive side to make sure that you know all of our CTE needs are being met, especially with the new animal science programs um, and some of the growing programs to help the, the budget we have now. So under Baker Polito um, leadership, they were big supporters of the skills capital grant. And we've gotten you know a lot um, from those grants. We're currently in the midst of applying for another one of those. We will see, um, you know, with the new administration, what level of support and what resources will be available. Uh, it, seems, it seems positive, you know. Um, but we, you know, so again, we don't know about those okay, ones, yeah. but the ones we, that are more consistent, like our IDEA for our, our um, yeah, IDEA, and what you know, what we've also what we you know, like the grant that we have for our SEL and mental health needs, knowing that. And um, so we just got that $140,000, you know, just like a month or so ago that'll help. And so we're, we're always looking, we're always looking for grants um, and trying to, like, I know I'm getting ready to submit a, a response to an RFP that was submitted to try to expand on some of the programs that we're doing, you know, um, but the ones I could say that more solidly occurring are the title ones, the title funds, or um, yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, can you just give me a sense of the campus? So we have the new building, we have this north building and east building. Are either those the old building or the old building still there or oh it's just just have a bigger a better yeah. sense of and if you haven't <laughs> been to our building please let me know i would love to have you come and get a tour but so i missed the tour when we did yeah yes. okay yes, but you're always welcome mm -hmm. you know i always say that is our school it is your school you know so um i want to say that east the east campus mm -hmm. was there previously and is still there okay um, but as far as everything else, it's new. Um, there are three homes that the district does own right behind the school. I live in one of them. So I'm, I'm there all the time. I mean, I'm at work all the time. <laughs> um, so, but yes, yeah, so those are, I think, the only still standing okay. um, buildings. And everything else is new. I do want to say, I think there had been 
uh, mention of should we sell those houses? Yeah, that, I remember there was mention of selling something. Yeah. And, and there was some talk that the capital costs would go down because of that. Yeah. And I would say that at this time, we're not interested in selling. Okay. Um, I, I think what we are looking to do is how can we use those properties to, to increase revenue mm -hmm. um, and, and to create revenue sources. Um, I know that a neighbor actually came to us saying, would we be interested in buying their house? along that street and I say if we had the money of course we would but we, we don't um you know but um because I think there are opportunities for us to um to make revenue with the existing um those homes the other two homes and then um the east campus I think will support our our, our programming okay and then so connected just so the capital costs are going down because that was a plan all along because we got very favorable bond rates. What, why is that? Yeah, um, it just based on the amortization. Yeah, based okay, yeah, on the amortization schedule not, not and the interest. Um, but yeah, no, it's okay. just um, the the payments we've been making. Those are both. And you're not going out for new bonds, right? You're you're done in terms of. So we do need to close out the MSBA project. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have a two point eight million dollar ban. Mm -hmm. um, because MSBA is withholding their final 5% payment until mm -hmm. we close up the project. Um, at this point, we're expecting it to be between two to $2.2 million um, that we'll be getting back. So at that time, there may be a very small amount of money we'd have to, to make up. But, but besides that, that's, that's, that's okay. the, the project is, <laughs> okay. is closed. Okay. <laughs> Well, is there? Area. It's oh, there. Yeah. It's getting there. And then I just have one final question. So you have some estimates for things like Chapter 70 funding. Where, and those estimates are, I mean, I just looked at the governor's mm -hmm. budget numbers. Um, are, are those based on, on the numbers that came out a couple days ago, or are those previous estimates that need to be updated? Yeah. 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 So um, un unfortunately, in, in some aspects this year, our regional agreement um, requires us to have a school committee voted budget 45 days before the first town, town meeting. Um, so that required us to have our budget passed um, the very end of January. Um, so those were estimates at this point. We um, have looked at the cherry sheet and it's something that we'll be looking at as administration and with our school committee um, to determine. Might you come and adjust the numbers that when you finally get to Arlington, back to Arlington? I think, you know, they seem pretty, the numbers seem pretty good. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. They keep very generous. Yeah, and we've noticed that, mm -hmm. but we're also um, mindful too that that's a proposed budget. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of um, revisions that will have to happen. So, um, but what we can say is this at the end of the day, I think that if there is any, you know, additional dollars that are coming back to us because of our estimate. And our estimate modifies. I think that we will definitely be having a conversation with the school committee to say, you know, what is in the best interest of how we um, amend our budget, you know, based on what the actual numbers end up being. One thing that I do know is we cannot increase our budget request, but if there's anything that we can do to decrease it, that's the only way we can go, right? So if it's possible, I cannot see why we wouldn't do that. We just don't want to commit to anything yet, just because those numbers, even yeah. though they look good, they're still premature. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anna, Alan, Jones, and then Charlie, right. and then Dean. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit more about the MTI program. Is it growing, shrinking? Is it financially net positive, net negative? Is there room for growth? Yeah, yeah. Um, so with the post-secondary right now, what they I think MTI actually has benefited greatly from um, the skills capital grants. Um, we actually, we have a number of grants that we're using up, which is allowing us to be totally self-sufficient. So it's growing. Um, what we're trying to do though is trying to create programs in such a way that it will sustain itself once the grant dollars are gone. So we're using these grant dollars to really help set up our programs, um, our marketing, like build it in such a way that 
because you grants are just that grants, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we create programs that when we can, we can charge for classes and, and it pays for itself. And we do have a few of those, you know, so we're looking to um, continue to grow that. Um, but I think, you know. Is there potential for it to be a, a revenue source? <laughs> yes. Significant revenue source? Um, I don't want to say that yet. I mean, it seems like you know, nighttime sort of unused capacity. There. Yes. Yeah. And, and we're also, you know, taking a look at what types of programs we're offering. How are we offering it? Who are we partnering with to offer services? So, for instance, you know, if we're helping in industries to upskill their employees, that we know is a revenue source, right? So, these are the types of things where how are we, who are our partners? How are we partnering with higher ed institutions? How are we connecting and partnering with industry? Those are all things that are under works right now, again, to create programs that so that MTI will be able to continue to sustain itself. Once the grant dollars, um, if we don't continue to get grant dollars, it needs to sustain itself, but also create revenue. Okay, because I know that the, the trades are really hurting for skilled workforce, and mm -hmm. it seems like there's potential there if if, if it's a net positive. Yeah. Okay. Charlie, thank you. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. It's very very interesting. I have uh, I have two question question areas. Uh, Madam Chairman, one is about the operating budget and the other is about the athletic fields. So if I can just talk about the, ask about the budget first. Um, the, um, it, there's a slide here that says that the operating assessment increased by 27%. Um, and when you mentioned the operating drivers, it didn't seem to me that any of them that you mentioned would be large enough to come up with an average increase in operating, in operating budget of 27 percent. Uh, I'm talking about a slide. I don't have numbers on the slides. So I can't, uh... um, I think that's just how the the breakout of our operating budget is seen. It's broken out into different um, categories. So the minimum required contribution is set by the state, um, and it has increased slightly. Um, transportation is separate. And then the remainder is the operating budget. So you'll, I think the percent in this category is somewhat skewed if you looked at in total. That's why, um, you know, overall your, you know, assessment, because the debt is so, is skews it down. So um, there, are, there are operating expenses in the minimum required contribution. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yep. If you add those three um, columns together, the minimum required contribution, the transportation, and the operating, that's your total operating budget. Okay. Then uh, another question is on the chart that shows the increase in four-year rolling average enrollment versus increase in assessments. I'll just give you one example. Uh, Arlington, Arlington's uh, change in average enrollment was 16%. And the budget increase was 12%. So that ratio of change is basically 75%. On the other hand, if you look at Dover, um, the same ratio of change is only 65%. And I didn't do it for all of the different categories. But wouldn't it, why would there be a different assessment based on changes in enrollment for different towns? Um, Dover in particular has a, a very small amount of students um, and on average three to four students. So they're, if you pick the town that percentage wise is it, gonna, you know, one change in a student ends up being very drastic. Um, our operating budget calculation is separate from our, our debt calculation. So um, our debt calculation is based 50% on enrollment um, forty percent on the the yield, the town's yield, and then a one percent um, or ten nine percent total, um, one percent from each member town. So, in particular for Dover, because they don't have many students, um, that kind of one percent that they get charged for the debt kind of skews their percentage. If that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. 
because they're responsible for 1% of the debt, which makes their assessment. Can you, can you a bit say then unequivocally higher. that the operating budget scales directly with the number of students, the distribution of the operating costs? Uh, yeah, the, with the four year rolling average. Okay, so that's so if you increase your if your number of students, if the average number of students increased 20%, then your operating assessment would increase 20%. For the most part, besides the, you know, if the minimum required contribution or the transportation, but yes, on, on a whole, um, they correspond and track very, very strongly together, just in particular for operating, whereas the capital is a slightly different calculation. Thank you. So if I may ask a question about the athletic field. So in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, Minuteman came to Arlington with a request to support, uh, I'll just summarize this, uh, an additional a uh, $1.9 million loan to uh, do some additional work on the field, which was six or $7 million capital expense. And uh, we were assured that um, this was all gonna be covered with the exception of the first year's $77,000 in debt service. The future costs were gonna be covered by revenues from the fields. Um, what's happened with that program and are the debts service requirements for that project in our assessment or are they being covered by revenues? So, and I'll let you take some of that, but I think what happened was that yes, the revenue from the rentals, and this is me that coming in as a new superintendent, my understanding is the revenue from the rentals would be put into an account where we would be preparing for the care of the fields, replacement of the turf when it comes, because that's expensive, right? So we'd be putting, funneling money in preparation for that in the future. The Because I did, I did receive the memo. Thank you for that, because that was the first time that I had seen the memo. Um, so I'm not familiar with, I had not heard until I saw this, the revenue from the rentals going toward the cost of building phase one. Um, that was the first that I had heard that. And the cost of phase one is, I want to say, included. It is in this assessment. The, the entire cost. The, the for the phase one of the six million, yes. So, including the one point nine million dollars that wasn't covered before. The the one point words, the one point nine million dollars um, was is debt. It's a twenty year note in the portion for Arlington and all the towns are within this um, debt slash operating line, not the MSBA line. That's right. Excluded. It's, 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 it's a separate, non exempt debt. Yes. So. So contrary to what Minuteman told us, we're paying for that in our assessment. Yes. Are you gonna fix that? I can't fix that. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, would, I think it's fair to say that I would not be able to fix that. Um, what I can say is, There's a second phase to the athletic complex. We put out an RFP um, for a partner to come in and actually pay for the rest of the build out of the athletic facilities, which would include the um, stadium seating, concession stand, the locker rooms, six tennis courts. Um, that was the second phase. And in paying for building that out, we would also go into a lease agreement with the bidder for them to rent at a nominal um, fee the athletic facilities. And it would be for first term 10 years and with the option for two additional um, five year increments until they got their return back, their return on investment for um, building out phase two. I share that to say that 
the expected revenue from facility athletic facility rental will be nominal until at least between 10 to 20 years. And then at that point, we should see much higher um, athletic field, athletic complex rental fees. We are, and that will go toward, again, the upkeep of the athletic fields, the equipment, space, all of that. Um, and we will continue to prioritize Minuteman, of course, first. Um, but we are, you know, renting to other organizations, but the priority will be to our Minuteman and then to the bidder. So we will not be seeing the kind of revenues that maybe was shared with you um, for a while. And um, according to the current revenues that are coming in, um, that would not be going toward, that is not going toward often. Yes. That's just meeting transparent and to what. <clears throat> so I appreciate your transparency. Yeah. And um, I have to say it's very disappointing. Um, and uh, I would like to formally make a request as I strongly supported that, that position uh, when Minuteman asked for the money um, that uh, you bring this up with the committee and see if there's not a way to, um, you know, get that somehow eliminated from the debt service that the towns are carrying in their exempt debt category. And maybe renegotiate the uh, contract with the bidders, you know, with the outside parties. There are always solutions to these things. We provided a solution when the school needed it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's critical that, that uh, Minuteman live up to its uh, obligations. And I realize that, you know, your uh, first year on the job, probably some of you didn't give you the right crib sheet, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's, a, it's an important issue. Can I add a thought to that? Sure. So I realized when I went through the correspondence about this, because of the, there was a Minuteman rep in between me and now who um, wasn't involved in the conversation, but I realized that in going through all of our documentation about it, that the one thing we didn't ask for from your predecessor was a signed agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say that I personally feel like that was a mistake on my part at the time, mm -hmm. and it's not a mistake that I would repeat. So future requests of this kind on your part for participation like this will require signed documentation yeah. that we can refer back to and say, well, you have an obligation to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a question and a comment, but then Charlie asked me a question right before, <laughs> uh, <laughs> before I got a chance. And that, that question's out. Um, so I guess I'll just make a comment. Um, so welcome. Glad, glad to have you here. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the many things I admired about your predecessor is he was passionate. As he told me one day when we were doing the uh, regional vote, mm -hmm. you know, he said um, he said something the effect of, you know, he felt his job was um, to provide vocational education to every child who wanted it. Right? Um, I don't believe that. Okay. Um, I believe I, I care about, I think a lot of people in this room and I think a lot of people in this town care about children from Arlington receiving vocational education, right? And so I'm, I'm happy that you're sort of gung ho and thinking about all these big ideas, but I want to sort of caution you that the like, Minuteman District has now always been the happy go lucky place it is today, right? I don't care, and I'm telling you, most of town meeting will not care that Watertown and Belmont do not have viable vocational education programs. They made that decision. I don't care what happens in Waltham with their new high school and their programs. I just don't. And there's not a majority of town meeting. There's probably not a majority of people in this room, even though they're far nicer than me, who won't say it out loud, <laughs> that care at all, right? Like we care about children from our town who want, as the largest member in this town, who want to go to that school to get into that school. 
and I just like like and that's that, that's sort of the bottom line, right? Like, and it and it, it's going to be hard to hear because I think some of these, like when you go to when we broke up with those other five towns many years ago, I think some of them are having like remorse over it. I mean, I know at least two of them have had one of them had a pretty I've tried, tried twice to get back in. Um, we don't. I don't think there's even an appetite for letting them like under any circumstance. They behave so poorly, and I just kind of want to point out. Like, I guess I'm just sort of giving you my my. You know, in between all this like goodwill that you have, cheer here that you know it hasn't always been um, a cheery, happy district, right? And I think we're we're very comfortable and happy as a town where it is today, but we don't want to go back there. Like we don't want to go back to some like wacky, crazy United Nations one town, one vote. Like we're not touching a regional agreement. We're not doing any of that. Like and we probably have some problems with certain people if they wanted to come back. I'd like to just add one thought. You, you mentioned that this, during your, uh, and I have to say, very eloquent presentation, it was deeply appreciated. But you were talking about expanding the school and maybe having another district or two coming to the, to the uh, or another town or two the district. And, um, you know, if we can't solve this problem, of the $1.9 million and adjusting the capital to cover that commitment. Um, how are we gonna come up with a formula when a new town comes in to equalize the, what was it, $150 million that we paid for the school? That's a much more complex equalization to take place. And so I, I, I think that's something that you should be cautious about. And those are, those are all of the different um financial models and everything that we've been doing research into um, in preparation. And again, it is the town's um, nine member town's decision how they want to proceed. What the school committee and we want to do is to do our part in making sure that our towns know what options that they have, why that we were we are presenting these options for you know now and thinking about the future. And it'll be up to our town. You know, um, we're just trying to to think about the future um, and making sure that our towns are are aware and have the choice to make. And trying to give you the best information, the best scenarios. Um, and it'll be up to you. I do hope um, that we are more than the worst mistakes we've ever made, and that we can have um, be given um, options to. To grow and do better, and that. Um, um, but I, I have heard some of the information, and I understand where some of that comes from. Um, and you know what our school committee and you know thank you. I know I told them you were caught up with work, so I'm glad you were able to make it. Um, you know, and you have a strong advocate here for Arlington and for Arlington students, very strong. And that's one thing that I really appreciate and one of the deciding factors of me even applying for Minuteman was the caliber of the school committee members. Um, and Can I so, just interject yeah. for those people who may not know, this is Mike Ruderman, yes. who is oh, okay. Arlington's representative on the school committee. Yes. The first time in my three years uh, presently of being a member of the school committee representing Arlington uh, at Minuteman that I've had the, had the pleasure of, of meeting you face to face. So it's a pleasure to get over here uh, this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What, the question of admitting a, another town to the Minuteman district, as I'm sure has already been mentioned, would have to be would have to be uh, you know, joint, unanimous. unanimously agreed to by all of the current member towns. Mm -hmm. Any discussions with any town that's sent over, say, say a soft inquiry, uh, you know, just sort of, you know, what if or could we? It's always accompanied in the next sentence with, well, you understand there would be a cost because you don't get to come in and become a member of a school district that's just built an expensive new building and is fabulously popular with the kids and the teachers. You don't get that just for raising your hand and saying, I'd like to be a member too. You're gonna to have to pay a portion of what that new building costs. And as the years go on, that number goes up. You know, currently we've had, like I said, some, some soft inquiries from, from some towns generally around you know, in, in our general area, but there's nothing being hammered out at the moment. And 
I was just telling yeah. them, Mr. Rudderman, yeah. that towards the end of the month mm -hmm. that um, we will be reaching out to the towns to um, share with them. Because it's actually been, I don't know how many months we've been working on, because it is not um, a simple calculation, right? So we've been, um, team more so than myself, have been just scouring through all of the different scenarios, just to come to triangulation of what about this, what about this, and um, and so we're nearing a point where we're ready to, to bring that to the towns. Um, and so we will be doing that. Um, but again, it's because of the school committee trying to be forward thinking um, and understanding that yes, while things are all rosy right now, we can't you know, rest on those laurels and think it's gonna be like that forever. That, um, you know, um, student attendance in towns uh, with new buildings, it's not just Arlington, you know, we've got a number of our member towns as well as non-member towns that are um, building new schools. And what's also happening across the state is there's a push because of the need for career tech ed, there is a push to also increase CTE offerings in just regular comprehensive high schools. So the competition, while it may be good now, there is a very likelihood that it may not be as competitive because there will be more offerings. So we're just trying to look ahead and plan ahead and give our towns that information. And then um, the towns can decide in what way that they would like to go. Um, but we, I hear the request to bring this because I agree with you. We have an agreement in the agreement. I just can't promise you that we can do this, but um, I will definitely be bringing it to the school committee and with also with the understanding that moving forward, um, any type of um, agreement like this, I usually always have signed documents because I want to cover the movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, and, and I will report back either through mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ruderman or, um, you know, uh, yeah. Ms. McClark, you know, yeah. but, and I just want to put a number on that for everyone. Um, it, it it was an official $1.79 million bond in April of 21. Um, what that adds to the budget is around $112,000 and about, it's about 110 each year um, for 20 years. So um, that just give, just to give you a little bit more idea of what actually impact it's having on the budget. Mm -hmm. Obviously that's divided out by the member towns, but um, just to give you some additional details on that. But we'll definitely look into it, sir. Annie. So I still have a couple of questions in the email that I sent you that I just want to hit to see if you have any answers to them. Mm -hmm. One of those questions was about health care. You're saying you're planning for a 10% increase. And my question is, are you and your other schools you're in a consortium with able to participate in the GIC as an alternative? And have you looked at it? Um, I will we are part of the Mass Bay Health Trust um, with, with four other regional schools. Um, I don't know at the moment if they have, but I can certainly ask um, them. Our assistant superintendent, well, actually both assistant superintendents are members on the board. So mm -hmm. at their next meeting, they can bring that up yeah. just to um, check that question out. Yeah, because it's not, it is, if the GIC is a less expensive option, and if you are able to participate, I know cities and towns can. Yep. That if cities and towns can do so, and they can show that it's a cheaper alternative, they don't have to bargain it with their bargaining units. And I would assume that would apply. So the first question is, are you able to participate in that way as school districts, or do you have to be a municipality? Um, and then the other question that folks asked that, that I think is of particular interest to us, if we have some numbers now working forward them to us, is the percentage of some students from Minuteman that go on to four-year, two-year, and trade schools. Because um, we're just interested in how that, uh, where your students go to after mm -hmm. school. So, I know I have to take my glasses off to see close. It's okay, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so, our um, 22 postgraduate data, we have um, one or point. So less than 1% that went on to a two-year private college, 7% that went on to a two-year public college, 
16% that went on to a four-year private college, 25% that went on to a four-year public. So that 16 private, 25% um, to four-year public college, 17% um, percent of our students continued to go on to apprenticeships. And then we had about 17 students or 13% that did other things, like travel with family, et cetera. And then other post-secondary such as trade schools, we had a little shy of 4% that continued to do that. And then we had um, 21 students, which was about 16% that we had like unknown, they had unknown plans. Great. So that's for the, our 22 postgraduate. The roundup is about 32% of our kids go from graduation to work, trade school, uh, military, uh, something else other than a formally matriculated education program, either two years or four years. So there's about a two to one uh, divide, and that's been fairly consistent uh, for a number of years. Right. And it sounds like it's a substantial uh, minority, like about a third <laughs> are going on to four-year colleges and one kind of I think two-thirds two two -thirds of our kids going to have both um, school. And part of that is from Miniman's teaching model, in that from the oh, no, I know. <laughs> from from the beginning of, of a, a student's career at Miniman, they're educated about not only what it is that they've chosen that they think they want to go on and do more of, but what it would require of them after high school. Are there employment opportunities immediately available? What happens if you want to do more than just what you can get with a high school degree? So it's something that's in front of the kids at least from their sophomore years. Uh, they're, they're thinking about this and they're, and they're acting on that information by the time they get to graduation. And I think we should be mindful of the shifts that's happening on a national level, right? And probably even international. More industries are saying four-year college degrees are not necessary. And if anything, because they're so, um, they're so short, right, of employees, they're saying, you know what, instead of doing the four year, let's get them just straight. Now there are different thoughts on that. I know I've seen some data in my previous district um, that when recession of 2008, the group that was least impacted by that recession were those with four year degrees. Mm -hmm. So, but again, that was 2008, we're now 2023 mm -hmm. and things have, are, have changed. Mm -hmm. And so I say that to say like our industry partners are pushing for our young people to see this option that, hey, you don't have to go to four-year colleges to get high paying jobs in these high demand industries. We will train you, you know, but what we always say, even if you go down that route, always continue your education. No matter where that is in your path, always continue your education. And preferably have your industry partners pay for you to continue your, you know, um, and, and they will, you know, they will. I, I know that, you know, in my former district, the hospital system there, they were like, look, you get them in our system, we will pay for them all the way up to them becoming a doctor. You know, so I'm like, you start entry level, we're gonna get you this degree, you know, an associate degree, get in there. And you know these were pathways you were creating with the hospital mm -hmm. to try to save mom, mm -hmm. parent, whoever, help save and kids take this as an option. But everywhere in any opportunity that we did was always trying to get as much paid for for the kids and the family, but always to continue. Don't stop mm -hmm. because you don't know where <laughs> things will go. And so you know, but I think our numbers could increase, that there's gonna be higher percentages going to apprenticeships, um, just because that's the trend right now in our economy and our society. So, yeah. Anything else? I'm done. Oh, okay. Gentlemen in the board. Um, I, I got a bunch of uh, smaller questions and one big comment. Um, first of all, we would really appreciate it if the 10% uh, increase in insurance doesn't come about, and hopefully you did better with the governor's budget today on your local aid uh, in looking, considering reducing our assessments. Uh, uh, our assessments have been uh, 
very high. And there's no comparative data here. Obviously, we can go on the DOE website and, uh, and get that, but we're paying $31,000 a student for operating. And when you factor in the capital, we're up close to 50,000 per student. And uh, I'd like to see how that compares to some of the other schools, whether it's Neshoba, Shashin, okay. That'd be great to have. Um, but anything you could do to modify the costs we're paying, we're, we're going out periodically for overrides every five years. And it's really starting to, well, it is costing our taxpayers a lot of money. Comment, small questions, sort of what percentage of the students now are sort of in the traditional trades, carpentry, plumbing, electricity, hairdresser, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of that whole range. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's becoming a small minority. Actually, at our school, it would not be. Um, they are actually some of our more popular programs, and they're all full. They're they're all full. Um, if we, you know, those are not we have maybe a couple that aren't at its max, but um, for us, those have been strong programs. And so um, I don't have an actual percentage um, of, you know, number of students that are in those programs compared to like our other academy, which is more of our health and human services. Um, but for us, they're all full. They're, they're actually the ones that are of higher interest. Um, than some of the other programs, but uh, I can get you actual numbers if you'd like. And uh, are you looking at your, are you doing a regular survey of your programs to weed out obsolete occupations? Give you an example. My son went to Minuteman. He graduated with a certificate in drafting. Mm -hmm. There were no jobs. Mm -hmm. He has a useless certificate in his closet. Uh, it, it should have been eliminated years before. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, are, what are you doing to constantly review your courses for programs which are simply obsolete? Yeah. So part of the requirement of CTE programs is that we have an, an industry-based um, advisory board that continues to review our curricular programs, continues to keep us connected with industry, uh, the types of certifications that the kids should be getting, the types of programs they should be, you know, the curriculum that they should be taught. So that's one way for us to stay connected with the industry. I know that um, as the new superintendent coming in, we will be um, taking a look at that as I start um, developing our strategic plan with the team. We'll also be coming to all of you for input on the strategic planning. So please know that's coming. Um, but part of that, I think this is a nice um, opportunity for us to say, okay, you know, how relevant are our programs? And um, are there programs that we do need to adjust and modify to ensure that they're connected to the, you know, emerging labor market? Um, and so that's, I know that our team does that on a regular basis. And a new, new superintendent coming in, that would be something that we'll be undertaking within the next, probably next year. I just didn't want to do that this year because right now I'm listening, observing, and learning. One of the most recent programs we retired a few years ago was, was uh, telecommunications, which telecommunications, the telecom shop was, was uh, devoted to preparing students to go into uh, what was then the, the emerging and burgeoning field of establishing and, and, and setting out the infrastructure for wireless communication. That seems to have become a, a mature industry and it um, you know, wasn't presenting the job opportunities and um, we retired. We still teach, we still teach electrical, we still teach um, you know, other, other higher tech shops, but uh, that was one that we just let go because it didn't seem to have the uh, industry prospects. So the, the short answer is the, these are under under yearly review. Great, thank you. With the, with the difficulty that that comes along with with trying to shift faculty or, you know, sadly sometimes you know having to uh, you know lose a faculty member who's who's expert in that, but it's just not what we need to present as an option to, to the kids. We're going to have to wrap up. Okay. I think and the gentleman, finance committee members have questions. Oh, it's Charlie. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I uh, 
following up on Al's comments, I just wanted to clarify something here. Uh, you know, the, the, the statement was made that the operating budget request assessment is going up by six point something percent. But I think we have to re remember that between fiscal 23 and fiscal 24, we go from 195 to 215 students. So the, the actual uh, increase in the operating cost per student is, is about 4.7%, 4.8%. So it's you know two thirds lower. In addition, if you take the total cost, uh, we're not quite at $50,000 per student yet. We're at, uh, in, in uh, fiscal 23, we were at um, 40,758, but in fiscal um, 24, we're at 41,548. So that increases because of the increase in the number of students is only a 1.9% on a per student basis. It's actually not a bad deal when you think about it. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. Thank, Thank you. you. For your team, and yes. then thank you, Mr. Uh, Court. I did have one comment I wanted to clarify. Um, applicants that submit an online application are ap applicants. A qualified applicant completes the full admissions process, records, recommendation, and just to get okay, your so full you question. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify for everybody because we're all hot on every RFP student wants to go being able to go. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's from our director from, of admissions. So. Yeah, there's been some. Uh, people will get hotter to call at town meeting if you're not there to answer some of those questions. Yeah, absolutely. No, and this is why we appreciate the prep for this, and we, um, you know, we appreciate the candor in our discussion, and um, as do we. Yeah, and as we appreciate we. the feedback. This is a dress rehearsal for town meeting. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your. Well, presence. if they're all nice and kind of you, then I, we should be okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We'll run interference. Madam Chair, do you uh, recognize anyone else to do? Uh, no, we have more things to do. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Monday night, we have, we still have RC conference. Yes, I can. Um, so I'm sorry, capital planning can come in on the 8th? Oh, the 8th yes. is Wednesday. Yes. yes. Okay. So on Monday, we have our people coming okay. in. And the community preservation. Um, so they are still not sure. I am, <laughs> yes, they, they need some more time. Um, so I um, have been told I will hear back next week. But I have reminded them that we need materials in advance. Right. Um, this is all they sent. This is one page. Thanks. Yes, they said that they do have a plan for an additional presentation to be sent. All right, we can keep on that. That would be. Should we just no. Good Monday. They said they cannot come Monday right. though. Yeah. So they can't. They, no. Right. Just arts and culture can at this point. So uh, on Wednesday, Daryl, we have capital planning, right? Okay, so capital planning committee is accident prone and several- Dangerous, dangerous committee. Yes, several members are not very mobile. So I <laughs> am going to have, I've decided we're gonna go remote for that meeting because it, it, it accommodates all of the injured parties of the capital <laughs> planning <laughs> Where were they skiing? And, uh, I, I don't know if it's there. Daryl may have the. Eden Cody is going in for foot surgery. That's that's it so far, but another week. So. Sarah, which day is this? So Wednesday the eighth is so remote. So Wednesday the eighth will be remote, and Tara will send out the the invite. Yes. Um, and get the meeting notice out right now. Um, we're planning to do capital planning on next Wednesday. And Carolyn should have reclass and human resources ready. Um, so right now all we have is arts and culture on Monday, maybe some budgets. Um, 
and then water bodies on the 13th. That is the schedule so far. Um, Daryl will do what he, Annie did. If you have any questions for capital planning, please get them to Daryl so that they can be prepared to address those specific questions. All right. All right, so that's scheduling. So um, let's talk about the minute and budget discussion. Um, so do you want me to make a motion or do you want to discuss first? Why don't you make a motion? We'll have it seconded and then we can have a discussion. So I move that we approve the minute man budget as requested. With their second. Second. Okay. Discussion. Any discussion? Article check. Oh, good question. Oh, 44. The total uh, amount is presented in the uh, presentation. Eight million nine hundred thirty-two dollars and nine. Eight million nine hundred thirty-two nine one six. Eight nine three two nine one six. Why do I have eight that eight million nine hundred forty thousand eight hundred ninety-seven? That's what was in the town manager. Oh, okay, okay. Eight nine three two nine one six. Right, do you have a motion to second it? Are they second? Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Charlie. So I think that there were some questions that Andy had asked to get answers to that she's supposed to get back to us. I don't know. I think we might. I'm still sort of upset about the way they've handled that $2 million note at one point. Eight something million dollar go because it turned out to be at the end of the day. And and we ought to get some response from the committee. Sure, we should get some response. And get some response from the committee. In other words, they you know, it's, we shouldn't let it give them a give them an all pass on this, you know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, would we just would we just um, table a vote on this until we hear from them? So, yeah, is that what you um, want to do, Charlie? That's what I would recommend. I mean, it's the committee's decision, but I I think uh, we went through a lot of trouble to bring that to the select board to get that signed off. I think you know Andy had at least three meetings at the time, as I recall, and and then it sort of disappeared into thin air. And clearly didn't get handed off from one superintendent to the other. Um, I, I just want to suggest some logistical problems here. One is that we don't know when their next school committee meeting is. So I might reach out to Michael and ask him when they're, because that sounds like she's got to go to the school committee with this issue and see whether or not there's a way that they'll adjust. It's going to be March 14th. March 14th. So yes. if it's March 14th, then I think, yeah, we should delay the vote until. And then I'll work with Michael to just make sure that it gets on their agenda if it's not already on their agenda to discuss this and that he has a copy of the memo and presents that memo to the school committee. Do we have a copy of that memo? Um, I have an email that I can forward it to, to you to, and Tara to get yeah. into it. That would be good. Other discussions? Yeah, well, if I forward it in the line, yeah. I can share it. Do you have the presentation from? Uh, I can actually just load it into SharePoint. Yeah. I don't have the presentation, Charlie. If you could, send I will. That. Uh, I'll, I'll get that to SharePoint. Yeah, and what I would do is put it in the twenty. It was in fall two thousand twenty. Yeah, so if you put it in FY twenty four budget, FY twenty four budget's minute man, then that's the folder everybody will be looking for. And I'm going to put the you voted in on November eighteenth. Yeah. Rebecca, I just had a question about the tabling. So, she, if I understood her correctly, she was implying that her hands were tied. That there wasn't, she wasn't sure that what she could do. Um, but so, if you could explain to me what what the what could the committee do that she, I just don't know. I mean, I, I personally, I wasn't satisfied with the answer. I yeah. mean, she's a new superintendent, and it wasn't. Um, you know, normally, I'd be a little bit more irate, but I. Yeah. Thought of that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
we should get an answer from the school committee. You know, let them know that we're, we're not happy with that. So basically, just turn it to them and I mean, say. In theory, they, they could just reduce the budget by the reduce yeah. our assessment by that amount. Yeah. 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 Okay. Dean and then Al. So I. Support and agree with Charlie is saying. And from my own perspective, I think um, it's it's not about the money. To me, it's not, right? I mean, 1.2 million, nine million, whatever. It's not a huge amount. It's not a budget cost that they did it, right? But it's about making sure we have a functional district, right? This was the first time they showed up under the new regional agreement to ask to borrow money. And they came up with a plan, they went to the member towns, and then they said they were gonna do something, and then they didn't do it. And so we kind of have two choices, right? We could sort of actually kick and scream right now in a very polite way and make them figure it out. And maybe they can't fix it this year, but they can fix it the following year and the year after and the year after, and we have a way to go. Or, can pass the budget and we can sort of let this fester and we can get mad and then they show up with a borrowing request for the phase two project and then we pitch a fit and say no and i don't think that's a good idea i don't think that's the viable answer is to wait and let it fester and build on us it's, it's sort of like okay we have a new path forward this is the first time you told us you were gonna um, borrow money using this mechanism you didn't do it the way you said you would and now we're gonna we're going to work it out on the front end before it's a bigger uh, thing down the road. And we are telling a superintendent or school committee we have no confidence in what they say. So I agree with Charlie. I think we got to deal with it now. Yeah. Did you make a motion to table? Uh, no, I just raised the question. Okay, I'll make a motion to table until we get a response on this issue. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. Shane. I have a question. Who was that agreement with? Was it with the superintendent or was it with the school board? The, the agreement mentioned in that memo, yeah. I would describe it as a verbal agreement with the superintendent. So do we know that the school committee even knew about this? No, we don't know that. Which is what I think we should ask our representative of the school committee to, to figure out, to, to find out. You could have that discussion with them. Yeah. And just say, hey, we have this memo, there was this agreement, there was communications about this, finance committee difficult to support this. And now we're being told that you're half the bargain. Minivans half the bargain is off. And, um, you know, as I said, the superintendent, a little bit personally embarrassed. Normally I get things in writing, but I apparently didn't get an actual document from Oklahoma on this one. So. Yeah, you do with the superintendent, you're dealing with the school committee or the school system. So. That's who comes to us. It's the superintendent who comes to us. Jennifer. So in my mind, this feels connected to the discussion about selling the selling part of the property, right? Because when the sort of the whole build on to future campaign happened and we're looking to the town for money, um, there was sort of a private discussion about how the capital costs were really high, but, but they thought they could lower them in the future, but they couldn't say that publicly because of MSBA process and funding. But there was sort of like a, you know, wink, wink, we'll be fine because <laughs> we'll sell these things, uh, which will e either fund the field or lower your capital costs. But no, of course, that wasn't put in writing either and seems to have been forgotten. So it feels feels sort of part, feels like part of a pattern at this point. It yeah. didn't really a pattern with the previous. With the previous, absolutely. Not home to the school committee, yep. the school committee yep. the current yep. Yep. that we can't operate like this in the future. Yes, 100%. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm, but I'm not sure, you know, to several other people's point, what we can get this year um, given the timing, the structure. You know, it's, it's politic and strategic to scare them a little by saying we're not Yeah, that, until you I'm in favor of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So far. A couple of comments. One, um, well, the superintendent made a brand new, the, the school committee didn't. So, and as people have said, that's part of who we're dealing with. And the other is, well, we may not be able to fix it this year. You know, hearing, well, 10 to 20 years from now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Know, and that's not acceptable. <laughs> so, not so, I think they should be able, while they may not be able to completely do it this year, although 
Charlie's suggestion that they just lower our assessment by that amount. Nice. Um, but, you know, they should be able to come up with some way to address this, you know, in a, a shorter time frame. I would say a small number of years. John. Uh, thank you. Um, so just to maybe put a number on it, I think she tried to put a number on it uh, in the middle of the meeting. But if I'm looking at the, the list of the, um, the bonds, there's a $1.79 million bond. Mm -hmm. And the current debt service on it is 115k. So then, if you know, you divide it by all the member towns, well, obviously the biggest one, maybe 20 to 30 thousand dollars, would be the, the amount we're talking about this year. Yeah. So I'm just thinking, like, it seems like on an eight million dollar assessment that they could, you know, pay, lower it by 20k without breaking their budget. Right. Except that that is new to capital costs are distributed weighted. Okay. Um, and so I'm not sure that it's that small for us. We, we, would, have, we would have 34%. 34% of 115,000. So, um, so close to 40, 30, 30 to 40,000, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, upwards to 40,000. But so they also have to deal with the other towns. Yeah, they would have to, yeah, so they they to deal with us. The entire us debt service would have to be adjusted. So. Yeah. Got it. I just wanted to put some numbers just to make sure I understood it. Thank you. Just a second, okay. is this the first year that it's a problem or it was done in the past and then it just fell off this year? I don't. So if they borrowed the money in April of 21, right, okay. we, we knew they were not going to have a field done in time to make rental income in the first year after borrowing. Right. This would really be the first yes. year, maybe last year, it would have applied to this year's head check. Yeah, right. we, we agreed to pay the first year. Yeah. yeah. But, and so we didn't ask about it. So this is the first year that would be defended. Yeah. Any further discussion? Danny, do you want to withdraw your motion? I will withdraw my motion to vote the budget. And we will we want to pass the do we have a motion? Um, it's been withdrawn. We have a motion to table the vote until sometime afterwards the yeah, after the 14th uh, look at the schedule i don't know if you want to put a time certain on it but i would say we're delaying it at least until our meeting on the 20th um, i have a motion to table so at least after the 14th and it's been seconded. Any further discussion? Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Unanimous vote to table. Um, anybody have any budgets? Um, Daryl, are you in the mood to? Have any questions about the capital plan right now that anyone might want to have throw your way? Anyone have any questions on the capital plan they want to throw Daryl's way right now? Can we to pull it up? No one has any. Sorry, Jennifer. A few questions. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, one is, do we have? So, so I I know that Arlington has done a lot of work in playgrounds in the last few years. Is there a sense of how long a playground lasts? Do we have? You know, is, is there an expectation playgrounds last twenty years or twenty five years? I've or never something seen like that? a specific. I'm just curious. I, just our, our local playground is getting redone on the schedule. I was just wondering if it was because of a time coming up or something. Or yeah. I'll give you a concrete example. Yeah. So I've lived in my house for 35 years, and we just completed the third renovation of the Stratus School Playground. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I was just wondering. I, mean, our, I think our local playground, will, it would be 20 years. So I was just curious. So I don't think it's 20 years, and it was more like 10. Yeah, I think so, some of it suffered. Well, that, um, that ramp. Um, 
at the Robbins playground. Yeah, yeah, that's been a lot. Yeah, totally trash them. Also, I think it really depends <laughs> on whether how it's used. Yeah, yeah, I, that makes sense. A, a more used playground would be different. Um, the Addison steps are they totally off? Awesome? <laughs> You know, the Addison for years and years, the Addison steps were on Megan Jane Crush. Are they not on here anymore? I didn't see them. I... Is, is what on? The, the steps at Addison? So the Addison is a huge issue, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think the focus is on um, uh, critical repairs that need to be done just to keep things going. And so, we get some space until the high school's done, until the TPW building's done, and we get a little breathing room. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of, there were like several requests. Little, requests yeah. Um, but we've um, pushed out any that aren't critical to keeping the building Got running. It. Am I looking this correctly that we're taking like no new debt service in 2024? Um, Jennifer, was that it for your uh, questions that you want, Daryl? Yeah, I think, I think so for now. I'll look through it again and I'll send anything else. Well, again, if you have any questions, you need to put them to Daryl. Um, so we will be meeting here on Monday the 6th. But we will be meeting remotely on the eighth. All right, we we'll want about that. All right, unless you don't have anything more, I'll we'll put a motion to adjourn. Do you have a budget? Do you have a budget? Oh, you have a budget. Oh, okay. All right, then we have a budget. Real, real budget. Uh, the reserve fund on page 156. So the <clears throat> amount is uh, in the book is one million nine hundred thousand seven hundred eighty-two dollars. Uh, Finance committee for many years has taken a position <clears throat> of using one percent of revenues. Uh, I went through with Julie Wayman the uh, formula, which is basically the total revenues minus the amount from the overlay uh, override reserve minus the exempt debt times one percent. So <clears throat> we, we could modify this like five times throughout the budget season, but I think it's just as easy to use the amount recommended of 1,900,782. So uh, if we don't use it, obviously it just goes back to the free cash at the end of the year. So that's my recommendation. Second. And Al, do you want to explain for the new people what, that res what the reserve fund is and how it's used? How is the reserve fund used? Can you tell oh. for the new people? Well, it's basically used for our, our uh, retirement fund. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the finance committee has control of the reserve fund uh, within its jurisdiction. And uh, we can uh, transfer items from the reserve fund to basically any budget or use of the town uh, if it if it needs extraordinary or unforeseen circumstances. Some people think it says emergency, but it doesn't. It's extraordinary or unforeseen. Uh, there's certain things that, that are just sort of not done, like we don't transfer it for raises that the town meeting has voted against. Uh, you know, we don't do anything that would overturn a town meeting decision that they made, I suppose, unless it's an emergency. Um, and what we've usually done Sometimes during the year, we've gotten transfer requests, uh, but more and more, we get all the transfer requests at one time in June. Uh, and we have a meeting in June that just basically focuses on election of officers and, town and reserve fund transfer requests. Uh, quite often it's uh, snow and ice. So several years ago, well, over the last 20 years, the, the finance committee has been bumping up snow and ice from 350,000 20 years ago to what is it now about eight or 900,000 
More than that. Yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. So we bumped it up consistently. And then we put money in the reserve fund because we used to actually have to have a section where we cover last year's deficit this year, or we, we cover this deficit in the next year. Um, and so the finance committee didn't like the deficit financing. So we did two things. We bumped up the uh, snow and ice fund and we put more money in the reserve fund. So we don't have snow and ice deficits anymore. Uh, sometimes there'll be a large uh, amount of money that we have to give for police or fire for overtime or uh, things like that. Fortunately, over the last few years, we haven't had to do that. Uh, flood, any kind of uh, damage, fire to a building uh, would be uh, things that we use it for. Uh, and sometimes we don't use very much because sometimes the manager can cover it by transferring amounts of money that's left over in one budget to another budget, which we could also do, which we also do in June. Uh, uh, so most of all, a lot of this would just go back to the general fund. So there's been a motion, was it seconded? I second that. Second Any further discussion? Topher. Just one comment. Um, it's the service on the exempt debt, not the entire exempt debt that's in formula. formula. So in other words, it's the revenues minus what we take out of the stabilization fund minus the service on the exempt debt, not all of the exempt debt. Right. Right. Times 1%. Anything else? All right, so let's take a vote on um, the reserve fund budget. All uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved unanimously. Any other small budgets? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.